السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Good morning everyone and welcome to another installment of SBK Sayyidina series My name is Taha Sagar and I'm leading the online content team for technical and professional programs of SPEKSA. Before I introduce our speaker for today, please note that you will be able to ask your questions in the chat box, but we will address them after the presentation is over. Please type in your questions and we will do our best to go through as many as time allows us. Our speaker this morning is Dr. Amr Abdel Fattah. Dr. Abdel Fattah is an SPE Distinguished Lecturer and Team Leader of Saudi Aramco's Institute Sensing and Intervention Team of EXPIC Advanced Research Center. He joined EXPIC ARC's Reservoir Engineering Technology Division in 2012. After, 15, uh, after more than 15 years as an R&D scientist with the U.S. Department of Energy's Los Alamos National Laboratory, Dr. Abdel Fattah has over 32 years of R&D experience in experimental and theoretical collide and interference science, electrokinetics, microfluids, and stimuli responsive materials. He has a track record of peer-reviewed publications, plenary and in, uh, invited presentations, journal editorship, patent and copyrights, R&D program development and execution, conference chairing and mentorship of postdocs, graduate students, and junior scientists and engineers. Dr. Abdel Fattah holds a PhD and a master's degree in chemical and nuclear engineering from the University of New Mexico in the United States, and a master's in geotechnical engineering and a bachelor in civil engineering from Ayn Shams University in Egypt. Dr. Amr, the floor is yours now for the presentation. Thank you very much, Talal. And uh, thanks uh, to you and uh, Nasser for this uh, uh, invitation. And thank you all for coming. Uh, so uh, uh, today I'll be sharing with you uh, uh, one of its basically uh, a distinguished lecture that I've been giving uh, this season. Uh, and uh, uh, thanks to Nasser and Talal for inviting me to uh, do the same for uh, the Saudi section. So uh, it's uh, so this is uh, basically a version of the same uh, deal, but I kind of you know uh, spiced it up for you. So uh, because this section is very special to me. So uh, uh, today we're going to be talking about nanotechnology and reservoir applications. And uh, 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 before I get started, uh, I need to uh, do some acknowledgement uh, for the SPE uh, uh, DL funding. Which is uh, which comes through the SP Foundation through member donations uh, and contributions uh, from offshore Europe. Uh, the SPE uh, is grateful to those companies that allow their professionals to serve as lecturers. So in my case, uh, SPE is uh, gratitude uh, goes to Saudi Aramco and to my management uh, here at Saudi Aramco. Uh, the additional support provided by the IM. Uh, before I even start, uh, I'd like to acknowledge all my team members and teammates uh, who contributed to uh, uh, to some of the work I'll be presenting uh, today. So, uh, as a quick start, I'd like to just uh, set the stage here and, uh, and 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 define what we'll be talking about in terms of nanotechnology, because uh, as you all may know, uh, nanotechnology field is uh, huge, and we, we want to just focus on what's relevant to our reservoir uh, applications. So with that definition here, I mean uh, uh, creation, characterization, utilization, and manipulation of materials with at least one uh, dimension from one to 100 nanometer in size. And with that, we include things like nanoparticles, uh, nanocapsules, nanodroplets, nanobubbles, and nanostructures, and so on. So this is what we will be covering uh, in the coming uh, 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 slides. But first, let's uh, uh, together agree about what are the key features of nanoparticles, what makes nanoparticles so unique and so important for our reservoir applications. The simplest and, and, and most obvious, sorry for that, uh, the, 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 the simplest and most obvious uh, property is the small size. So the size that's uh, less than 100 nanometer or so, uh, that 
uh, uh, gives us, you know, uh, uh, an idea that they are too very small. They can go through our uh, reservoirs, pools, and pool throats without causing uh, any uh, or much damage. Uh, we also uh, can realize at this size that the number of atoms on the surface of the nanoparticle is comparable to the number of atoms in the bulk of the nanoparticle. And that's something that you do not realize in uh, the, uh, the bulk domain, in the macro scale. Because in the macro scale, you know, the number of surficial atoms uh, is very, very insignificant compared to the number of atoms in the bulk of uh, the material. Uh, in, in, in other words, uh, you cannot uh, move a table, for example, by just manipulating uh, uh, the surficial atoms of that table. You need to harness the bulk of the table to move it. But in the nano uh, size domain, uh, you can easily do that. Another feature is the substantial surface area per unit mass. And uh, to explain this a little bit further, you know, if you take a, a, a centimeter cube of any material and subdivide it into one nanometer cubes of that same material, you will end up with a surface area as big as a soccer field. So this is significant uh, surface area. So you have uh, surficial atoms, significant surface areas that allow you to manipulate and load the nanoparticles uh, and, and decorate even the surfaces of these nanoparticles with many, many uh, beneficial compounds. Uh, another important feature of nanoparticles is the size dependence of their properties. So in example here that uh, is very common is uh, gold nanoparticles. Uh, so gold in the bulk and the macro scale is yellow as you uh, know, but if you make gold nanoparticles, suspend them in water, then you will see different shades of red of the same nanoparticle or gold nanoparticles, but have different sizes, and they will appear to you as different shades of, uh, of red. And that's also uh, very, very important in our applications, as I will uh, elaborate uh, later. Another very interesting example is nano bubbles. And uh, like again, macro bubbles, as uh, we all know them in, in fizzy drinks, they don't stay in solution. They rise, they burst quickly, so they do not stay uh, much longer in, or, or a long time in solution. But if you can make nano bubbles, and you make them in the nano size, maybe less than 100 nanometer, they tend to stay for long times in uh, solution, uh, even uh, 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 without any mixing or without any agitation. So what this means to us is that we can have materials, uh, the same material, but can have different behavior in the nano scale. We can have different interaction with the light. We can have different interaction with the surroundings when they go in that nano scale. And you can build on this for new uh, benefits and, and, and realizing new properties that were not known to us in uh, the macro scale. So this introduction uh, about nanomaterials in general, uh, let's get to the business. What's, uh, uh, what's in it uh, for our business? And as I promised by the title, we'll be talking about the reservoir applications. But it's worth mentioning here that nanotechnology is actually applied across the, uh, uh, the, the entire domain of the NP, from exploration, drilling, production, and even in unconventional uh, applications. So let's get to reservoir application. And when we think about a reservoir and how we apply nanotechnology in reservoir uh, applications, would like to think of our reservoir as a human body. So uh, uh, why is that? Because you know what we want to do in a human body is almost similar to what we want to do in our reservoir, such as we want to target and find certain, uh, uh, we want to find the oil that's trapped in certain regions of the reservoir. Uh, we want to target deliver uh, a material to only specific regions in the reservoir. We want to eliminate only certain parts of the uh, reservoir. 
So that's almost similar to what we do in the human body in medical uh, applications in terms of diagnosis and, and treatment uh, using nanotechnology uh, uh, today. So with this, uh, 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 let's look at reservoir, uh, like oil recovery applications. So my presentation is actually divided into two parts. One here that we're going to spend a little bit more time uh, on, which is the recovery uh, side, and then we'll go to the characterization uh, uh, side of nanotechnology. So let's start first by this general, you know, simplistic uh, picture of what's left in our reservoir after uh, secondary uh, recovery. So as you all know, uh, what we have left is oil that's either adsorbed to the rock uh, surface or oil that's trapped in tight pool regions or regions that we cannot access by uh, a conventional flood uh, operations. So before I even get into that, uh, uh, onto the, the, the interesting applications, I just want to get something out of the way. And that's a misconception that has been, uh, you know, uh, mentioned uh, in the, our early stage of uh, implementing nanotechnology and reservoir applications. And I want to share this with you so you know it's a misconception uh, because it's very important to the progress and development of nanotechnology. And this misconception is that thinking of nanomaterials in reservoir applications as a material that would coat uh, uh, the surface of the rock and the reservoir rock and change the weightability of the reservoir rock and therefore uh, help to turn the weightability more into uh, uh, less water wet, uh, less oil wet so we can mobilize the oil in the reservoir. And uh, I'm just going to show you here why this is a misconception by taking this very simple example where we uh, assume 100 nanometer silica nanoparticles that you want to inject in a reservoir that's only one kilometer uh, uh, deep, you know, like the length of the away from the injection point is one uh, kilometer, and a reservoir that, say, has a 30 percent porosity, and you want to only cover 25 percent of that available surface area uh, in this uh, uh, volume, uh, uh, in this pool volume. What you would need for that uh, you would need about 400,000 tons of silica nanoparticles in order to do 25% coverage of that uh, reservoir. So this by all means is not economic and it is again a misconception because this is not why we want to utilize uh, nanomaterials and nanotechnology in the reservoir. It's way, way smarter than just this. Uh, 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 concept that is again a misconcept. The true or the will, uh, the today uh, uh, realized, will realized uh, a, a process by which nanoparticles improve oil recovery is what I'm showing you here. And uh, first, when you inject the nanoparticles into a reservoir, they tend to fill this which between the adsorbed oil and the surface of the rock, as you can see in the first stage here on the top. So the red dots here, or the reddish dots, these are nanoparticles that fill this which uh, between the adsorbed droplet and the surface of the uh, reservoir rock. So by doing this, you would create a, a gradient of uh, nanoparticles, it will have more nanoparticles on one side of the droplet compared to the other side, which then drives a diffusion flux that pushes the droplet and disjoins the, pro the, the, the droplet of the surface. And then further, uh, these nanoparticles would actually surround and start to fragment the large oil droplet into smaller oil uh, droplets that can uh, move easier uh, in the reservoir. So this is the uh, hypothesis of how nanoparticles can improve the recovery of adsorbent and even uh, and, and, uh, trapped oil, uh, some trapped oil in uh, the reservoir. 
So uh, uh, this here is a, is a reminder, if you would, that about trapped oil and why trapped oil is hard to get using conventional methods. And the reason is the very, very low capillary number. And as you all, uh, uh, reservoir and chemical engineers, know a capillary number is defined as the product of the viscosity and velocity of your injected fluid divided by the interfacial tension between the injected fluid and the oil uh, in your reservoir. So in, in conventional, uh, in current operations worldwide, everywhere, the, uh, the capillary number uh, uh, is very, very low, somewhere between 10 to the negative 7 or 10 to the negative uh, 6. And that's very low, and that's why we cannot overcome this uh, uh, capillary trapping. And, and, and in order for us to, uh, to, uh, to mobilize the trapped oil, we will need to enhance that capillary number by a few orders of magnitude. And one way to do this is, again, by uh, either increasing the uh, viscosity and or the, uh, the speed or the velocity of the injected fluid. And this, by all means, is very uh, either impractical or uh, not economic at all. Uh, the only access or the only, the best way to uh, uh, increase the capillary number is then by decreasing the interfacial tension, uh, as you uh, may know. And uh, uh, the, the best way, one of the, the, the most common ways of reducing interfacial tension is using surfactants to reduce the interfacial tension. So now let's see how nanoparticles can actually enhance the performance and enhance the uh, function of uh, surfactants in our reservoir. So uh, this, uh, uh, like um, the, the figure here on the left, is a simple mix of uh, SDS surfactants with uh, uh, like 50 nanometer zinc uh, oxide nanoparticles at different concentrations of the surfactant. The top figure here is it shows the profile of the interfacial tension as a function of time uh, without the, uh, the zinc oxide nanoparticles. The figure at the bottom here shows the same but with uh, the zinc oxide nanoparticles. And as you can see here, there is a little bit of improvement when we add the uh, nanoparticles to the SDS surfactant. Uh, and as you can compare the two uh, 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 corresponding profiles uh, in here and here. So we have a little bit of a reduction in interfacial tension as a result of the inclusion of nanoparticles. So I should mention here that the surfactant and the nanoparticles are not associated. They're not, so the surfactant is not really integrated. They're just going, and why is that? Because, you know, the SDS and the zinc uh, oxide nanoparticles, uh, uh, they're both, uh, you know, uh, they will not associate uh, electrostatically because they have similar charge. So, uh, but again, you can see a little bit of reduction in the interfacial pitch. Now, if you can if you take something CETA, which is a cationic surfactant that has positive uh, heads and uh, negatively charged particles like silica nanoparticles, so now the surfactant would associate with the nanoparticle. And in this figure here, it's showing the interfacial tension as a function of the concentration of CETA. The top curve is for CETA alone without uh, the silica nanoparticles. And the rest of the curves here uh, is the IFT as a function of CTAP concentration with different uh, loads of nanoparticles. And as you can see, up to this point here, uh, to like 0 0.01 uh, uh, weight percent uh, of CTAP, uh, you can see um, uh, clearly a reduction in interfacial tension by including uh, the silica nanoparticles. So this is what uh, this is the simplest way of uh, you know of uh, showing some benefits of nanoparticles when we uh, combine them with surfactant. But 
Uh, and using that same concept, uh, there are today, you know, some commercial products and, and, and applications, uh, field applications of what we call surface functionalized nanoparticles. And what I'm showing you here are uh, two examples of field tests where uh, hydrophobized nanoparticles were used to improve the productivity of two fields. The one on the left here is, was in the Wilston Basin in the U.S. and the other here in the Wolfgang Basin. And as you can see by comparing the red and the blue lines here, that nanoparticles, uh, uh, so the red here is the, is the uh, represents the wells that were treated with uh, the hydrophobized nanoparticles, and the blue uh, is the wells uh, that were not uh, treated. The same for that curve here on the right. So you can see the improvement of the productivity of the wells that were treated with the hydrophobized nanoparticles. And these operators here claimed something between 40 to $50 per barrel of oil as profit uh, uh, from this uh, simple operations. So that shows you that nanoparticles can actually, even in the simplest uh, form, can actually provide very beneficial uh, financial, financially and operationally uh, can provide good, good benefits. So uh, we can take this a little bit uh, and advance it a little bit now. We'll go from this uh, simple approach to a more complicated approach, a more complex approach, if you would say. So in this case here, what if we can actually encapsulate the surfactants uh, 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 into nanocapsules and have these nanocapsules target our myo and carry the surfactants and target deliver the surfactants mostly uh, to the oil, uh, mainly to where you want the surfactants to go. So what if we can do this? We will be able to reduce what we call uh, 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 diffusion or, or delay because of diffusion into tight pores and bit in pores near the injection uh, uh, well bore. And we also capitalize on, uh, uh, on the chromatographic effect that's inherent to uh, nanoparticle transport in, in, in porous meat. So by doing so, we can actually deliver and, and penetrate the reservoir deeper using the same amount of surfactants and reduce the loss of surfactants to, uh, to the rock surface or to the regions where we do not want the surfactants to go. So this way we can take the surfactants deep to uh, the oil that uh, uh, we want to uh, recover. Hmm. So one uh, approach here is to use what we call hard surfactant nanocapsules. So these are uh, one type of these hard surfactant nanocapsules is uh, mesoporous silicon nanoparticles. So these are 50, 100 to 100 nanometer type uh, nanoparticles with pores uh, uh, in the nanoparticle itself between 20 to uh, 500 angstrom. And you can incorporate different types of surfactants into these uh, 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 mesopores. Uh, uh, and they, they, they can also control the release of these uh, surfactants uh, from the uh, nanocapsule, which is controlled mainly by diffusion and the surrounding uh, ions uh, uh, in, in, in the water, uh, uh, in the reservoir. So this here is the, I mean, shows the results uh, that, uh, you know, uh, a sample of the results that shows the slow release a feature of these nanocapsules, where you can see the IFT re, uh, being re, uh, reduction in IFT uh, over time up to 14 days in this uh, left figure here, and the IFT continues uh, to uh, go down by several orders of magnitude in the 14th day. And this is the release here on the right, the release of the, uh, the CTAP uh, surfactant over time after 12 days, uh, we have about 40% uh, uh, of the surfactant was uh, released. And of course, more information on these will be in these, uh, you know, uh, references that I mentioned uh, in the bottom. 
So the other type is what we call soft surfactant nanocapsules, or better known as nanosurfactant, as one of the, uh, uh, the in-house developments uh, here in Aramco. And these are basically stable uh, oil nanodroplets, or uh, uh, oil swollen micelles, if you would, that they can target, deliver uh, uh, the surfactant and release the surfactants when they encounter the oil that is required. And these type of soft uh, surfactant nanocapsules are suitable for uh, uh, surfactants that are have that have more uh, affinity to oil. So they're more soluble uh, in oil than in water, uh, such as petroleum sulfonate surfactants. You may know that petroleum sulfonate surfactants are hardly used in high salinity with high salinity water, or never actually used with high salinity water. The reason is they uh, are not compatible, they're not stable with high salinity water, as the figure here or the image on the left shows. By incorporating these petroleum sulfonates into droplets of mineral oil or other oils uh, that are uh, small in size, and, and stabilizing these droplets in high salinity water using a zwitterionic surfactant, we were able to produce a highly stable uh, uh, nanofluid of petroleum uh, sulfonate surfactant. So with nanotechnology, we were able to take a surfactant that cannot be used in high salinity and now made it available for use in high salinity and high temperature uh, uh, reservoirs like our uh, reservoirs here in, in, in Saudi Arabia. These are quick uh, results to that, uh, results of how these nano uh, surfactants or soft uh, surfactant nanocapsules uh, perform. Uh, they're very, very stable for a long time under high temperature in seawater. Uh, the size of the droplets are between 30 to uh, 50 nanometer, uh, sometimes even less. And uh, they are able to reduce the interfacial tension uh, with crude oil, uh, like in this case here of, uh, of Malia oil. That reduces that interfacial tension by several orders of magnitude, and also this interfacial tension reduction it remains uh, uh, consistently uh, even when we heat it and put it uh, under high temperature uh, for uh, multiple years. So it still shows that reduction in interfacial tension. Very importantly, also the tend to not absorb uh, as we wanted them to do. They do not lose their active ingredients to the bare uh, uh, rock surface. They do not just absorb to the rock surface. So now we know that they have better chance of moving deeper into the reservoir. Very, very key feature of these nanosurfactants is that how they emulsify the crude oil by minimum uh, 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 mechanical energy input. So almost uh, it forms a, an emulsion with the crude oil, but the interesting thing is that over time that emulsion breaks slowly, and in this case after five days almost back to forming a bank oil and a separate phase. What this tells us that the, they do their job by mobilizing the oil and then later uh, they form a bank of oil because and without the need of a uh, demulsifier, they start breaking the emulsion, the emulsion starts to break by itself and back to form a bank uh, of oil. And the reason here, the key here is what is the uh, solubility of petroleum sulfonate in the crude oil. So when the nanosurfactants completely, uh, the drops reach the oil, they coalesce and merge with the oil and deliver the petroleum sulfonate, petroleum sulfonate, then slowly uh, it starts uh, staying in the, in the oil phase and, it, and, 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 and forms this bank of oil. I'm running a little bit uh, behind, so I'm going to have to uh, speed up a little bit. So uh, uh, one also feature, a uh, good feature of these uh, nanosurfactants uh, or the soft uh, 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 surfactant nanocapsules is the ease of making them and the scalability of the process to make them 
uh, in the lab the same as you would make in, uh, in, uh, in the field. Uh, and very interestingly also is, as you may know, petroleum sulfonate is a product you can get from crude oil. So you can, uh, and, 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 and in like several types of crude oil that exist here in Saudi Arabia, can be sulfonated to produce very high quality petroleum sulfonate that you can then use to make the nanosurfactant and use uh, to inject into the reservoir and improve the recovery of the reservoir. And as you can tell from this, that enhances the economics and enhances also the sustainability of our uh, uh, UR or uh, in uh, oil recovery applications. Uh, this here is uh, just a glimpse of a field trial where it was done. Uh, 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 it was done using these nano uh, surfactants that shows the scalability and uh, uh, the low risk of uh, losing injectivity when we use it uh, with the reservoir and together with the true oil uh, mobilization benefit. The other more and more, uh, uh, you know, what if we take these now solid, uh, what are called hard uh, surfactant nanocapsules and merge them into uh, these soft surfactant nanocapsule and form what we call uh, the multi-component nanocapsules. I'm not going to, uh, you know, spend a lot of time on this, but this is uh, a very recent development that shows an even unrealized uh, 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 benefits here where you can now see the reduction in the IFT as well as the slow release of the different types of surfactants uh, 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 over, uh, over time. So, uh, uh, so again, uh, what I'm trying to show you here is that how nanotechnology can improve the performance of uh, nano surfactants in the reservoir and how we can capitalize on these very, very unique properties of nanotechnology to improve uh, the utilization and performance of surfactants in our reservoir or other chemicals uh, in, in that matter. The last uh, piece here that uh, we can uh, do with nanoparticles is what we call autonomy or autonomous nanoparticles. How can we make the nanoparticles even move by themselves in the reservoir without the need of advection, without the need of pumping? And uh, we were able to capitalize on a phenomenon, an electrokinetic phenomenon called diffuse euphoresis, to have the particle uh, harvest the salinity gradients in the, that you would expect in a reservoir and move by themselves in response to these salinity gradients where they can then deliver uh, treatment or a surfactant uh, uh, to trapped oil, for example, in, in tight pore regions in, uh, in, in the reservoir. So they can target deliver the surfactant to areas that are not accessible by normal water flood uh, operations and without pumping. So only by harvesting this potential energy or chemical energy that exists uh, in several situations in our uh, reservoirs. I don't know if you can uh, see the videos here. I think we had a technical problem with, the, uh, 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 with whatever with the, the videos here, so you cannot uh, uh, see them. I apologize for that. Uh, but uh, believe me here, what this two videos trying to show you is that by uh, uh, we have a horizontal channel here that's blocked at the end, and we have a nano uh, particle solution uh, flowing in that vertical channel here. And without salinity gradient, uh, you do not see much of the nanoparticles going at this end uh, channel. While in, uh, when we impose a salinity gradient, where we uh, uh, replace the water in the horizontal channel with seawater. Now we have a gradient with low concentration or low salinity in the outer uh, channel and higher salinity in the horizontal channel. You can see the particle, uh, particles rushing into uh, uh, the dead end pore. Uh, and sorry, you cannot see this here in, in, in the video, but uh, you just have to believe. So with this again, we are able or we can, we can 
uh, deliver uh, uh, surfactants specifically to trap oil in pipe core uh, regions and enhance the recovery of these uh, regions. So here is to summarize what nanotechnology can add to our uh, uh, existing operations. If we want to get this residual oil, we can either use surfactants, but we know that surfactants will not be able to penetrate uh, 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 that deep into the reservoir. If we can take these surfactants and associate them with nanoparticles or encapsulate them in nanoparticles, we can migrate the surfactants deeper into our reservoir and get a little bit more oil for the same amount of surfactants we're using. Or even. And finally, if we capitalize on these smart properties of nanomaterials and uh, something like the uh, autonomy and harvesting the chemical potential, we can even harness and access these type four regions that were not accessible to us and uh, recover that oil. So hopefully that uh, can convince you where nanotechnology can contribute to improving the performance of our uh, recovery uh, processes and uh, in typical uh, high salinity and high temperature uh, reservoirs. Now I'll move quickly to the final part, which is the characterization of uh, uh, reservoirs using nanotechnology. And what nanotechnology adds here is our ability to create a large number of analogs of uh, uh, tracers that we can use to establish connectivity between uh, uh, wells, between injectors and producers, for example, simultaneously. As you, as you may know, today the industry lacks uh, the, the large number of uh, surfactants that you can use to uh, to build a simultaneous connectivity across an entire field. Uh, so what nanotechnology can provide us is being able to create surfactants using the same chemical backbone, so it's the same chemistry, but by adding, by decorating uh, uh, some antennas uh, or like functional molecules, uh, in simple words, onto these nanoparticles, we can distinguish between these nanoparticles. So we can make what we call barcoded uh, nanotracers that have the same chemistry, but we can distinguish and separate them when we collect them uh, uh, in, 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 uh, from the wells. So by doing this, we can create hundreds uh, of uh, barcodes of tracer, nano tracers that have different barcodes that we can uh, 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 that we can distinguish and detect at very low uh, concentrations. So uh, this here was also another field uh, trial where we, uh, you know, assess the performance of these tracers or nano tracers if they can survive the reservoir conditions if we can collect them and if we can separate them and detect them at very low uh, concentrations. Finally, one of the uh, also very important technologies uh, relevant to nanomaterials uh, is magnetic nanomappers or water like flood front nanotracers that we can use to in situ detect uh, uh, the water front uh, 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 using EM uh, techniques. So this is one of the uh, technologies also uh, we are working on. It's still in uh, kind of in the early stage of, uh, uh, of developments uh, 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 compared to the other uh, that I have uh, shown you so far. So finally here, let me summarize some of the uh, main scientific and operational challenges that we have learned over the years. Uh, when utilizing nanotechnology in reservoir applications. So the scientific challenges that I want you to think uh, about when you are thinking of developing nanotechnology or nanomaterials for reservoir application is one is the stability of these nanomaterials under high salinity and high temperature conditions. As you may know, these two elements, the high salinity and high temperature, are the biggest enemies to uh, voidal stability or keeping the particles 
in solution for a long time. Uh, the operational challenges are uh, simply the size of the reservoirs that we are treating, the heterogeneity in, in, in the reservoir, and therefore the economics and how we can upscale uh, the materials that uh, we are uh, proposing. So here I'm proposing solutions for these uh, uh, challenges and how this is how what I mean, basically the lessons that we have learned over the years. So that summarizes possible solutions of how we can uh, overcome uh, uh, these challenges. I'm not going to go over uh, all of these, but one thing I just want want to leave you with here is when you think of nanotechnology and how you apply nanotechnology, try to capitalize on the smartness and the smart features of nanotechnology. Things like target delivery, uh, things like autonomy, uh, things as responsiveness. So these are the smart features of nanomaterials that are available to you and I to harness that are not available in the molecular or the bulk or macro uh, scale. Another thing I want you to keep in mind, when you think of a nanotechnology that you want to really uh, apply in the field, think of something that can be scaled up simply and something that can be made uh, preferably uh, uh, on-site uh, uh, using conventional mixing tanks and tools. You do not want to think of something that's, uh, that requires complex facilities and tools and so on. So these are the, the, the most two important take-home messages that I wanted you uh, to, uh, to think about. And uh, I will conclude with this. But if you have any question, you have my my email uh, if you want any follow-up uh, questions or more elaboration uh, on any of the topics I shared with you today, please feel free uh, to do so. Thank you all and sorry if I took a little bit longer than I should and I am ready for uh, your questions. Thank you Dr. Aum for the very fruitful and eye-opening presentation. We'll start taking the questions from the top. Uh, do you want to read them? Do you want me to read them for you? Uh, let me find out where I can see them. If you go to the chat, uh, you can see the button at the uh, at the bottom. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to find out here and see the participants. Uh, why don't you go ahead and, uh, and and read the first one until okay. I? Okay. The first question comes from Mar Marwa Al Sinan. She says, "For the soft nano emulsion." Can you talk about the methodology of preparing ra large amounts of emulsion for lab studies? Usually, a sonicator is suitable for preparing small amounts. Also, what is the optimum sonication time for creating a stable emulsion? Very nice. Thank you, Marwa. That's a great question. We do not use any sonication mainly to make these uh, 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 emulsions. What we capitalize on here is the potential, the chemical energy and the balance between the, uh, the zwitrionic or the, let's say the, the components of the university emulsion, which we call the uh, 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 surfactant uh, 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 nanocapsules. So there is no sonication, it's only shear, it's only mixing using uh, blades like you would use, that we used in, uh, uh, in, in track tanks. Uh, so I hope this answers your question. Okay. Uh, the other question comes from Amani Al Ghamdi. She says, "What type of bonding is there between the NPs and the surfactants? What makes surfactants binds at certain point and gets released upon contact with organic? Is the configuration of encapsulated NPs stable in inorganics and non-stable in organics?" Mm. Okay, so that's a chain of questions here. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so the first part is the surfactant. So let's say uh, we're talking about hard. Uh, I don't know if you're talking specifically about uh, the mesoporous uh, nano uh, particles uh, with embedded surfactant. So the the release is limited by diffusion and is triggered by the different the, the, the specific ions in water uh, in the in, in the seawater. Uh, what binds the nano the surfactant to the particle is mainly uh, electrostatic. 
So you could see from, I think, from the example I showed with CTAB and, and silicon nanoparticles, you can see the, uh, the positive uh, head groups and the CTAB attaching to the negatively charged uh, silica nanoparticles. There are other uh, ways of, of how surfactants adhere and uh, with, uh, uh, with the nanoparticles and, and, and one, of, uh, you know, one of these could also be uh, some sort of uh, steric uh, type stabilization that makes these surfactants or these nanoparticles uh, stable in the presence of the uh, surfactants. So, but we can talk more about this, Aman, if you uh, if you want to uh, if you want to elaborate more. Okay. Next, uh, Marwa Sinan also built on her question. She says, besides visual inspection of bottle tests, did you conduct tests to analyze emulsion structure? How can a structural analysis be beneficial to your study? Structural uh, analysis would be significantly uh, beneficial to our study. Uh, one problem, Marwa, we have, uh, these are very tiny, very small size uh, droplets, as, as the TM image I, I shared here was showing uh, things between 20, 30, 40 nanometer. These are very, very hard to visualize uh, in situ. Uh, however, we have done also uh, some indirect uh, measurements, such as, uh, you know, monitoring, doing DLS, uh, dynamic noise scattering, and uh, to determine the size uh, over time and see if the time if the, if the size of the droplets is growing or or the distribution of the nanoparticle size uh, is shifting in order to uh, uh, in order to kind of uh, you know uh, make a decision or guess whether they are aggregating or coalescing or growing in size. But, uh, and we're trying now to, uh, we have done also some numerical type simulations, and we have a couple of papers on that, uh, uh, on, uh, on how uh, the, the structure of these uh, emulsions uh, would look like. But, and indefinitely, it's very, very important uh, piece of information uh, for our development. Okay, the next question comes from Mohanad Hamur. He says, does chemical tracer injection work as a solution? So chemical uh, chemical tracers, as I uh, mentioned briefly, uh, of course it does, in, in, in for, but, but the, the use is limited of chemical tracers. As you may know, that uh, available or commercially available chemical tracers are not many. And, uh, uh, and the ability to have a chemical tracer that, uh, or a, a suite of chemical tracers that you can inject simultaneously and collect and being able to uh, differentiate between the different tracers is very hard to do with chemical tracers. So uh, you can only do this by nano tracers. Why? Because you can decorate, you can, you can harness the, 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 uh, the, the surfacial atoms of the nano. Uh, particles and uh, uh, label these barcodes or uh, induce these antennas uh, that you can use to distinguish between uh, the different nanoparticles. So uh, yes, chemical tracers, I know they're widely used, and uh, but again, uh, we're going beyond that because of the limited variety of uh, chemical uh, nano uh, chemical tracers in reservoir applications. Uh, okay, the next question comes from Clemens. He says, what do you think will be the major breakthrough for reservoir on a chip? Well, that's a dream, uh, Clemens. Uh, so if you're talking on a reservoir on a chip, if you're talking about a microfluidic uh, system that represents the reservoir, I assume this is what Clemens is referring to as a reservoir on a chip. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think this is uh, uh, something that uh, can be achieved and can be a good uh, tool for us to understand the poor scale uh, processes that happen in, under, uh, under in our reservoirs, especially if we can make this reservoir and a chip of materials that represent uh, the reservoir and being able to apply conditions 
such as pressure and temperature and salinity uh, that uh, are inherent to, uh, to oil uh, reservoirs. Thanks, Glenn. Okay, uh, another question from Azim Amir. He says, how can we better address the challenges of keeping the nano emulsion surfactant stable in nano size throughout the dilution or changing conditions from surface to downhole conditions? Mm -hmm. Have you seen any improvement with swollen micelles and uh, multiple surfactant selection? Yes, yes. This is this is a very very uh, uh, very good question, uh, and all questions are good so far. Really, really good questions. But this one is. Uh, very important and the, the reason is this is basically what we do when we develop our nano uh, materials is how, how they would perform as they are subjected to these different conditions of temperature salinity dilution and when we dilute them in the reservoir and uh, uh, so using the data that we create out of these uh, you know we design the type of the, uh, the, the surfactants we use, that we design the type of nanoparticles we use, and so on. There are different, different ways of stabilizing nanoparticles uh, in high salinity, for example, and uh, that will still uh, uh, be persistently stable under varied conditions of salinity and, uh, and temperature. And, and, and these, are the, uh, these are the approaches that that we uh, take or should take uh, to stabilize the nanoparticles. Okay, our final question is from Mohammed Kamal Hussain. He says, "Can you please shed light on smart nanoparticles that can play dual role, like as tracer and surfactant?" Ah, <laughs> wonderful! And uh, it looks like you're thinking along the same line we are. And uh, yes, so like the example I've shown you of these multi-component nanosurf capsules, uh, uh, you can, uh, you know, you can have a recovery agent and you can have a tracer at the same time in one nanoparticle. Uh, so, uh, uh, so that's why we call them multi-component nano, uh, uh, nano capsules, uh, because you can integrate different components. And of course, by uh, doing what you just mentioned, adding a tracer and a recovery uh, agent, so that's a dual, uh, uh, dual purpose kind of nanoparticle. And uh, we, as well as other researchers across the industry um, and, and academia as well, are looking into that. Uh. Okay, I believe this takes us to the end of the session. Thank you again, Dr. Amr. I'm sure that all of the attendees that came out of this presentation with useful information that they can apply directly or indirectly to their job. Uh, I would like to thank you again. And uh, for the attendees, uh, I'm sure you guys can reach out to Dr. Amr uh, for any questions you have in the future. Please follow us on Twitter and uh, our SP PKSA page to know uh, on uh, to get news on our future uh, webinars to come. Well, thank you, thank you very much, all. Thank you, Talal. Thank you, Nasser, and everybody. And uh, I apologize if I went through very quickly, uh, but I really wanted to share as much as I can with you, uh, and because this is a very, very uh, dear to us, uh, this technology and nanotechnology and how it can benefit your operations. And reservoir applications in general is, is very uh, dear to, to, to me and our team here. Uh, so I apologize if we went through it quickly. But again, you have my email, uh, shoot me an email, and we can discuss this further if you need to. Thank you all very much. All right, thank you.